The top story is live from the Sky News City studio. Oil prices surge as Saudi Arabia and other major producers announce a shock production cut. The CEO of the software company OneDisco resigns after an internal investigation identifies more than $115 million worth of missing bookings. Millions of households see their broadband bills rise, but not all companies are going for mid-contract price hikes. Plus, could Gibraltar's gridlock be at an end as its new runway tunnel finally opens after 14 years? Good morning, this is Ian King Live, an hour of business and economic news from the heart of the city. And the oil price has shot up by as much as 9% this morning after Saudi Arabia and other members of the OPEC Plus grouping yesterday announced unexpected production cuts totalling more than a million barrels per day. Well, a barrel of Brent crude, which on Friday night was changing hands at $79.27 per barrel, shot up at one point this morning to $86.44. Well, the Saudis are going to cut production by half a million barrels per day, while Russia, which is not an OPEC member but a part of the OPEC Plus grouping, said it will extend its existing half a million barrels per day production cut until the end of the year. Well, Brent crude is currently changing hands at $84.31 a barrel. That's up 5.5% so far this morning. Joining me now is Victor Katona. He's lead crude analyst at Kepler. Victor, good morning to you. I mean, this is, of course, on top, we should remind people, of a $2 million barrel per day production cut that was announced in October. Absolutely. Uh, OPEC is doing everything, OPEC plus, I should say, is doing everything that it can to control a price floor, which is palatable, which is to the enjoyment of all, of, of all the members. And effectively, it's putting through a very strong political message. And that's, that message is really manifold. First of all, OPEC is OPEC plus is really dissatisfied with how things have been going with uh, effectively a string of macroeconomic woes destroying oil prices for them because Brent at 70 is not palatable even though supply and demand balances are pretty much the same as they used to be. Also, OPEC Plus is saying no OPEC, the, the NOPEC bill in the United States is not palatable. They are saying it loud and clear, we will react. And, and I would even say that uh, there's, a, there's a little sort of, um, as an undergirding story, OPEC Plus is also saying that the fact that the US is not buying back the SBRs the way that it promised to be is also not palatable. So it's a very strong political message. It's, it's a very... Uh, poignant from from the Saudi Arabians that they are doing this effectively three days after they've they've said that they will be joining the, the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization. So there's there's a there's a pivoting in 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 the oil markets towards Asia, towards more alignment with with the Asian interest than than with any other interest in the Atlantic Basin for that matter. Yes, you touched on there the uh, strategic reserve, uh, reserve. The Biden administration said only last week it wouldn't be topping that up after drawing down quite heavily. That seems to have annoyed the Saudis. But why has the Biden administration taken that approach? I think the Biden administration just doesn't really want to anger uh, a lot of its stakeholders. It doesn't want to be seen as, as an administration that's pro-oil or in any way conducive to oil prices uh, being high. So ultimately, it will wait uh, it will wait when taking action will be sort of uh, politically palatable. Right now, it's not. Even though technically, technically everything was about to be uh, the SBR replenishment, we had WTI even lower than the 67 to 72 dollar per barrel bandwidth that initially was put out by the White House as 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 you know as the interval when oil prices drop to that level, we'll start buying. They didn't do it. In fact, when oil prices or WTI prices were 65, the Energy Secretary of the United States went out saying that we'll be postponing some of the uh, repurchases into, into next year, 2024. So again, it, it has become kind of a, a nuisance for, for the Biden administration, oil as such. And because they perceive it to be that difficult politically, they just don't do anything. They delay decision until, until you know, next term, next administration whatever that might be. Now, you, you raised a very interesting point just now, Victor, as well, when you said there was an Asian dimension to that. Now, Beijing, of course, has just brokered a diplomatic deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Is it possible that China is behind this, this decision or it's had some influence on it, some bearing? Well, I think that the Chinese would not like overall uh, higher oil prices. However, the Chinese have one thing which 
most countries, for instance, in the Western world don't really have, and that is security of supply. Literally last week, so again, what a time to be alive, just so many things happening at the same time. Literally last week, Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Aramco to be specific, bought a, a minority stake in China's largest private refiner. Not only that, it has also uh, signed a, an exclusive supply agreement with another refiner. So effectively, the Chinese have contracted Saudi barrels to such an extent that they are the lar largest market for, for Saudis. So even though prices are high, the Chinese will always know that there's, a that there's crude for them. Now, with more than 1 million barrels per day off of the market starting from May, not everyone is so, so secure. Not everyone is so sure that they will get the, the, the crew that they want. And even more specifically, not everyone is so sure that they will get the crude of the quality that they want, because it might end up that you have a lot of light sweets, but specifically the medium sours that the Middle East has always been specializing in, those will be very scarce. And, and you know, again, that's a privilege. That's a, that's a benefit to the Chinese. They can always rely on the Saudis uh, to, to supply their barrels. Everyone else will just have to rely on the spot market, which is tough. Absolutely. Now, Victor, uh, what are the chances, do you think, of these production cuts holding? Because in the past, where we've seen production cuts announced, the price goes up and then some producers are tempted by the higher prices to uh, to carry on pumping at the normal rate. I mean, Russia in particular is notorious for that. Will, will this production cut hold? I think it will hold, but there will be some point of uh, or, or some moment of disappointment when a lot of people will realize that the half a billion production cut that Saudi Arabia has pledged has in a way already been taking place over the past couple of months in a sense that Saudi Arabia has been underperforming its quota in January, March 2023. So they will not cut outright the half a million. They will be just producing less than they should. And the real production cut would be somewhere in between two and 300,000 barrels. So that's the only thing that, that, that's going to hit the, the market at some point. But overall, seeing how uh, willing OPEC Plus is in, 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 in having that price floor and having at, at least $80 per barrel for Brent, if not more, I think that the production cut story will stay throughout 2023. The only real story uh, concerning the production cuts will be Will Saudi Arabia genuinely cut half a million or will it be less? I think it will be less. But in terms of maintaining a political message that we're serious about the price floors, we're serious about what's going on with supply and demand balances and, and the overall dynamics, and we will take action whenever that's, that's required, that will not change. That's the new OPEC plus uh, mentality and the new OPEC plus narrative that they, are, that they are pushing out. All right, Victor, we've got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bit of uh, breaking news to uh, bring you. We've got a bit of reaction from the government to uh, the announcement uh, news that we broke about half an hour ago on the channel that uh, the teachers' union has voted for further strike action. The uh, education secretary, Gillian Keegan, has said that after costing children almost a week of time in the classroom and with exams fast approaching, it is extremely disappointing that the National Education Union have called more strike action. Following a week negotiating in good faith, the government offered teachers a £1,000 payment on top of this year's pay rise, a commitment to significantly cut workload and a headline pay increase of 4.5% for next year, above both inflation and average earnings growth. The NEU's decision to reject it will simply result in more disruption for children and less money for teachers today. More on that throughout the morning here on Sky News. But now some other business news stories for you. And the founder and chief executive of the software company One Disco has resigned after an internal investigation into suspected fraud found more than $115 million in missing bookings. David Richards said he was sad to be leaving One Disco after 18 extremely enjoyable years. Eric Miller, the chief financial officer, is also stepping down with immediate effect. Well, One Disco said that the investigation had found that its sales for 2022 should have been $9.7 million rather than $24 million, while bookings should have been $11.4 million rather than $127 million. 
The cinema operator Cineworld said today it's halted the sale process for its US and UK and Ireland arms with immediate effect. The debt-laden company said it's planning to raise $2.26 billion as it seeks to emerge from Chapter 11C bankruptcy protection before the end of June. Well, Cineworld, whose brands include Regal, Cinema City, Picture House and Planet, said the planned financial restructuring would involve lenders providing around $1.46 billion in new credit, as well as buying $800 million worth of new shares. I can tell you the share price is 37% lower right now. And McDonald's is reportedly temporarily closing its US offices this week as it prepares to inform corporate employees about job cuts. The Wall Street Journal says the layoffs are part of a broader company restructuring. McDonald's, which employs more than 150,000 people around the world in both corporate roles and in its own owned restaurants, said in January that it planned to make difficult decisions about changes to its corporate staffing levels by April. Now, last Friday was a big day in Gibraltar. 14 years after work began on it, a tunnel for traffic to access the frontier with Spain without having to cross the runway at Gibraltar International Airport. Well, the new tunnel, for the first time since 1941, allows for an uninterrupted flow of traffic from one side of the runway to the other, and it will significantly improve traffic flow throughout Gibraltar. Well, joining me now is Mark Zwork. Zwork. Do, do apologise there. Chief Operating Officer no of Sunborn Yacht Hotels in Gibraltar. Mark, very good morning to you. Sorry about uh, struggle to pronounce your surname there. I mean, this, <laughs> this tunnel has taken a, an awful long time to complete. Why the delays? Well, I don't know, but there was a couple of construction companies involved. So, But good morning to you uh, from sunny Gibraltar. The, uh, I mean, the, the tunnel has actually taken longer to build than uh, the Channel Tunnel did between England and yeah. France. Very true. And we're really excited. Uh, we're hoping for more and more free flow of uh, traffic. You know, there's about 10 million um, arrivals every year. Uh, so I think that this is actually going to really help open things up and um, hopefully bring more flights in as well. So what is this going to mean for your business particularly? Well, the hotel occupancy is directly related to uh, the amount of uh, people arriving by air. And... Um, when uh, I see this as a great opportunity that there could be more airlines and more flights coming into Gibraltar, which would bring more tourists and therefore improving the occupancies of other hotels. How important is tourism to Gibraltar's economy? Well, it actually um, constitutes around 130 million pounds of uh, revenue um, per year. Um, sounds small, I guess, when, it, when you compare it with the UK. But um, for this size of economy, um, it's quite large. Um, the total economy and the budget here uh, for Gibraltar is around 2.4 billion. Um, so there's a lot of other services and things taking place. Uh, but tourism as a whole is super important. Uh, we're only approximately five hotels here um, in Gibraltar. And um, the, the Sunborn constitutes almost 200 of those. And the more the more tourists we can attract and allow to come in smoothly um, and freely, uh, the better off we will be. Now, Gibraltarians voted in the Brexit referendum to remain in the EU by nearly 96 per cent. What has That's Brexit correct. meant for the uh, border crossings in particular? I presume it's added to some of the congestion, like the, what we've been seeing in Dover over the weekend. That's true. A little bit more. Um, and it's, uh, I would call it maybe more, um, well, it is stricter um, and there are restrictions um, on the amount of days that Gibraltarians um, can go into Spain and also British uh, citizens um, as well. However, um, I think as far as like with most things, you know, once you get yourself organized, um, you know, it's not really that much of a problem anymore. But presumably this tunnel, though, is going to be a big uh, assistance in terms of uh, helping flows. Absolutely. Um, I've already driven it a couple of times uh, just to, try to test it and see how it went over the weekend and now on a Monday. Um, it is uh, Semana Santa in Spain and also, you know, the beginning of Easter here. Um, so it's a little quieter, but um, I have to say it, um, it's quite impressive uh, for a tunnel. And um, but it um, it's great. It's really and I've been here in Gibraltar for a little over six years and um, I've been hearing about this tunnel for 
you know, practically every day since. And um, I'm just really thrilled that it's finally here and open. How many Spanish nationals roughly come into Gibraltar every day? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, most of the people that are traveling over, which constitutes around 30,000 um, really by day, um, it's uh, probably about 90% are Spanish. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite a number here, as you can see in the video, the, the tunnel. Uh, yeah, but, uh, and presumably a lot of these are your employees. That's correct. Yeah, we employ around 180 people. And again, about 90% um, are uh, from our Spanish nationals. Now, that's not the only tunnel that's currently under discussion in Gibraltar. There's also talk of a, a tunnel linking Spain and Morocco that would go under the Gibraltar Strait. What would that mean for Gibraltar's economy? Oh, I think that would... Uh, well, I'm, I'm unsure about how that would go, but that, that's, the Gibraltar Strait is almost 900 metres deep. Um, I, um, I'm really sceptical, I guess, if you will, about that. Um, but there is um, a tunnel... Um, a pipeline, sorry, not a tunnel, uh, for oil and um, electricity that comes from uh, Algeria to Spain. So I guess it can happen. Um, that would change things quite a bit because there is a lot of trade between Morocco and Gibraltar. Uh, we get, we personally, I mean, uh, you know, here at the hotel, we do get a lot of supplies that are coming from uh, Morocco. And so I think that that would immensely uh, change things uh, to connect Africa uh, to the Iberian Peninsula. And Mark, how about your business right now? What, what, what are occupancy levels like? Well, we're fluctuating and it's a kind of a, let's say a, a pre-pandemic and normal winter. Um, right now, you know, we're hovering anywhere between 70 to 80% occupancy. Um, we grow up a little bit more uh, during the summer. Um, and have longer stays. Our normal stay now is roughly around two to three nights, um, but um, in the summertime, that extends to around five to seven nights. Um, we we see around 100,000 people a year um, here at the hotel and staying in the hotel. And, um, you know, the thing is, uh, with the addition of more flights, um, we could see that grow. Uh, right now, there's approximately... 40 flights per week. During the winter time, there's around 18 to 20. Um, so if we could see that uh, increasing any amount, um, that would definitely affect our business. Very good, Mark. We have to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And welcome to Gibraltar. Thank you, Mark. That's Mark Skavork there. Uh, most big management consultancies, the likes of McKinsey, Bain, Boston Consulting and the consulting arm of big four accountants such as Deloitte and PwC are owned by their partners. It's much rarer to see them listed on the stock market and owned by shareholders. That's the model though for Elixir International, which listed on AIM in June 2020 during the middle of the first Covid lockdown and which stars itself the challenger consultancy will today. The company, whose clients include HSBC, Tesla and Mars, reported a full year pre-tax profit for 2022 of 15.7 million pounds. That was up 29% on 2021. Well, the founder and chief executive is Stephen Newton, and he joins me now. Stephen, welcome to you. I mean, traditionally, you specialised in financial services, retail, and digital. You branched out into other disciplines there. Where, where is growth strongest right now? Well, there's three ways you can. Good, good morning, firstly, and good morning to your viewers. There's three ways you can look at growth, and we look at it in a geography lens, we also look at it in an industry lens, and we also look at it in a capability lens. And geography right now, our biggest growth market is the US. It's by far and away the, the biggest consulting market out there, and we're seeing very accelerated growth up north of 50% in the US market. And then if you look at it by uh, industry, we've, as you mentioned, we were initially strong in, in, in financial services. We're branching out into telcos, consumer goods, pharmaceuticals, retail, etc. That's another, another, another view on, on, the, on the perspective. And then the, th the third one is capability. So we, we focus in on digital innovation, transformation, cost reduction, which is very interesting in a downward trending market or in a, in a headwind market, so to speak. So yeah, we've, we've seen growth from all of those areas. That's very interesting. So, I mean, it sounds from what you're saying, though, it's, it's about managing specific challenges like costs like the need to, for digital transformation, Correct. less than going for growth almost? Well, it's interesting. I mean, clearly the market is a bit tough in the last year. I mean, we're very pleased with our results, having grown 30% uh, uh, over the year and 18% underlying growth. So that was uh, 
really, really encouraging for us, but all our clients are facing difficult challenges, of course. Um, but what we're finding is that I think it's what it's meaning is people are being a bit more focused. You know, so where clients are seeing, uh, a lot of our clients are focusing on digital because they're realizing that's a big future and they need to be in that space. Of course, now there's a bit more emphasis on cost reduction, supply chain management and all of that kind of good thing as well. So it's, it's a question of being more precise now, I think. Now, you're obviously not paying McKinsey-style salaries and yes. your industry is notorious for people job-hopping. Is staff retention an issue for you? Well, interestingly, we've got a very interesting model. You mentioned at the, at, the, at the start that we're a listed company and it's a very specific model. You mentioned that we're a challenger. We're trying to challenge the industry in terms of its remuneration model. Um, there are not many listed companies. In the top 10, there's only three. Um, and the market's bifurcated a little bit. It's almost 50% the top 10 and, and then the other 50% is at hundreds of thousands of small boutique firms like ours. But we're using the equity model to incentivize both our, our partners and our staff. And we think that brings a much longer term perspective for, um, for, our, for our people. So they actually have to stick around and earn the value. So our partners are probably 70% motivated in equity, which is very different to the cash model of the big firms. Who do you hire people from? Uh, we tend, well, our favourite is to grow people internally, right? Um, one of our other strategies is also to acquire boutique firms. I mentioned entrepreneurialism. The thing about um, the boutique firms, these firms exist because they've probably got founder members, founder partners who are very entrepreneurial themselves. And so we'd like to bring in those founders into our, into our businesses through an acquisition strategy. And that complements our existing team of all very entrepreneurial people too. So we obviously take from the big firms, but that's the more difficult proposition because we find that they're not, um, they're not as entrepreneurial and we want a bit more of an entrepreneurial edge to, to our people. Yeah, now you mentioned that uh, more than 40% of your revenues come from the US now. Yes. You've done a big acquisition there recently. Yeah. Is, is there still more in the tank? Are you looking for more acquisitions? Oh yeah, constantly. You know, we, we, we've, you know I mentioned there's hundreds of thousands of boutique firms out there. We've looked at over 4,000 and um, continuously looking at, at good firms. And when we see good opportunities like the acquisition of ILAP out in the US, um, where it's p uh, fitting a specific geography opportunity for us, which is the US, but also data and analytics, which is key to decision making now in boardrooms, we obviously wanted to complement our skills with that. So always looking for things that complement the, the business model we're trying to adopt. Now, as you say, you're in a lot of different countries, a lot of different industry uh, sectors. Where is optimism most positive right now? Ooh. Um, I'd say so, tell me it is somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, I mean, it, it, it is difficult, but um, I think the consulting industry itself has seen 15 years of growth. Um, and while it is slowing a little bit, it's still growing. So I think the consulting industry is growing. It's quite resilient to recessions, actually, consulting, because you can, you're either focusing on revenue in good times or cost reduction efficiency in, in, in sort of more difficult times. Um, I think that's that's probably uh, the industry that's probably the most positive in my view right now. Yeah, uh, but I mean, obviously, digital transformation is of driving course. an awful lot of business. Of course. Which are the sectors that are dragging their feet on, on digital transformation and not perhaps doing as much as they ought to? Well, it's very difficult to say sector-wise, but I'd say, they, you know, we tend to work with those, those clients who are challenging and, and moving into the digital world. So, you know, our clients are pretty bold and they're out there trying to embrace the change that, that they need to embrace. Um, obviously, there's always la laggards. I wouldn't say there's a specific industry that I would, I would uh, point, out, point to, but um, you know, it can be within the industry, there's certain clients that perhaps have a different model, a more street, high street model or a, a more digital model. So it does depend on the industry and it does depend on, on the sector, I guess, a little bit. I mean, we're obviously very inflation conscious right now. And you mentioned that clients are looking to cut costs where they can. Yeah. Sometimes that might even involve cutting consultancy fees. What, what, what's happening to you on the fee front? Well, I'm a great believer in if you deliver value, you get paid value. You know, so I think a profit, this is part of the reason we wanted to be public too, is if you show good profits, you're showing your clients good value. And uh, this is a, this is a, um, a truism, if you like. So. Um, you always get pressure if you're doing poor service. If, you, if you're making a difference and adding value, then the pressure's not so much. So, yeah, I, I don't feel that there's any particular change in the market. I think it's just the, the same kind of pressure. Clients are demanding, and they should be. Um, and we've got to deliver to them, and then they pay our, pay our fees. All right, Stephen, got to leave it there. Busy day for your results today. Do appreciate you spending the time to chat to us. Thank you. Thank you.
A little bit of uh, breaking news to bring you. You'll be aware overnight there was an explosion in St. Petersburg which killed a well-known uh, pro-war Russian blogger. Well, Russia's National Anti-Terrorism Committee has just issued a statement in which it says it has been established that the terrorist attack against the military blogger Vladlen Tatarsky in St. Petersburg yesterday was planned by the Ukrainian Special Services. More on that throughout the morning here on Sky News, of course. And still to come here on Ian King Live, we'll have a look at how global markets are doing this Monday morning. The start, of course, of the second quarter. Don't go away. This is the story of the night. Are you feeling well? There's this illusion of power. They're going to cross to us live. Okay. Thank you so much. Brad Pitt is now a prolific producer behind the scenes. I want to meet that guy. OK, I'll talk to you. Me. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I've had a great time here. I love England and would like to move here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. I'm Greg Milam, and I'm Sky's chief North of England correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Well, the oil price is obviously at the uh, centre of attention this morning following the production cuts announced yesterday by the OPEC Plus grouping. Barrel of Brent crude, we mentioned it at the top of the programme, it's trading at $84.44 a barrel. There you go. It's currently $84.21 a barrel, still up nearly 5.5% on the session. Well, on the equity markets, it was largely a positive session overnight in the Asia-Pacific region. Sydney finished up two-thirds of 1%. The Nikkei in Tokyo was off, up half of 1%. Shanghai got the yellow leader vest, that was up three quarters of 1%. Hong Kong, more or less unchanged. Mumbai was very slightly lower. Well, in Europe, stocks have made a healthy start to the second quarter. The uh, Cat Courant in Paris, currently ahead by uh, just under half of 1%. The Mibi Milan is up by half of 1%. DAX in Frankfurt, up a tenth of 1% right now. And the Ibex in Madrid, well, more or less unchanged there. Here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in uh, positive territory right now, up two-thirds of 1%. That's a three-week high led by the oil majors, as you might expect. BP and Shell alone. There you go. The FTSE's 52 points to the good there. Well, 39 points of that alone has come from BP and Shell. Some of the banking stocks are ahead this morning as well. Well, outside the FTSE 100, again, it's all about the oil stocks this morning. Harbour Energy, that's the uh, biggest independent producer in the North Sea. And uh, Tullow Oil, they're both up by around 6% apiece. There you go. Well, Tullow's up 5% now, hunting. That's another interesting one. That's an oil services provider. It shares up some 5 and 3 quarter percent right now. Among the fallers, well, the cyber security group, NCC, you'll recall we mentioned them last week. They had an absolute lulu of a profits warning. The shares are off another 4% percent 
this morning. Elsewhere, Wizz Air is off some 3% right now. It's published uh, some passenger numbers this morning. On the foreign exchange markets, well, all that uh, talk about uh, OPEC production cuts uh, sparked the dollar into a bit of life there. But as you can see, uh, it's uh, given some of those back now. Sterling actually more or less unchanged right now against both the dollar and the euro. Likewise, a single currency more or less unchanged against the dollar. Well, I'm joined now by Neil Wilson. He's chief market analyst at Finalto. Neil, good to see you this morning. Um, we can't avoid talking about the oil price, but I guess the bigger question people have is what will this mean for the broader inflation picture? Yes, I, I mean, clearly it's, it's not, a, not great for inflation if, if oil prices are, are higher. We saw a lot of inflation over the last couple of years has, has been driven by energy. Um, you know, you are starting to see that, that fall with the latest data has suggested that you know, the, the base effects from, from, from energy is starting to contribute to, to lower inflation. Um, I think that the worry would be that you know you get this flare up again in 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 that sort of energy component of the inflation data. It just makes the, the overall more sticky. Um, I think on you know on the sort of broader broader sort of look at it, um, you know it, the, the the services inflation that we're seeing right now is incredibly sticky. It's not going away. If you if you combine that with with energy inflation too, then you're gonna you're gonna get uh, a tougher environment for the central banks and 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 you know yeah. probably see probably see some more tightening have to take it to take place. Which is why I presume all the banking stocks are uh, in pretty fine fettle this morning. Well, that's that's certainly the case. I think as well. You know, you you've, you have seen a bit of calm being restored with uh, regards to the banking crisis. If you if you can call it a crisis, I think um, it certainly uh, was a was a very um, big impact on certain banks. We've seen that, but but on the whole, it looks like the market's kind of coming around to the idea that, you know, there might be problems underlying here. There might be something happening. There might be a credit, you know, credit tightening, credit crunch down the line. But we're not going to see sort of 2008 style uh, implosion. What are your reflections on the first quarter? I mean, it actually turned out to be a lot better than people were expecting. If you look at some of the continental European stock indices, I mean, the DAX in Germany and the CAC 40 in France were up by sort of 11, 12 percent. Not bad going. Yeah, there, there were some great, great performances. I, I think you look at it partly on the sort of the amount of selling that was done in 2022. So you saw a bit of a, uh, a bit of a snapback. Um, the FTSE had a much more sort of circumspect uh, quarter because it had actually done really quite well in 2022. I think on the whole, you call it a kind of formal trade. I think um, we saw it throughout 22. Uh, wherever the, the market was buying into this idea that the Fed was going to pivot, pause, whatever you call it, start you know, looking to, to stop hiking rates. Um, and, and that's kind of what we've been seeing this, this quarter too. And I think uh, you've seen a big, big um, bid for, for tech stocks, in particular NASDAQ, up about 17% for the quarter. Um, I think there's an element of uh, chasing safety um, in that, and it sort of sounds strange to talk about tech as a safe place, but uh, in a in a world of great uncertainty, high inflation, and um, you know the Fed maybe looking to actually pause rate hikes, um, then then tech actually maybe has has some appeal, and that that's what we've been looking at this uh, over the first quarter. Yeah, I'm I'm quite surprised though, looking at the markets today, how sanguine people are being. You know, OPEC have just cut production. Bad for bad for uh, inflation, as you say, potentially pointing to more interest rates, and yet more or less everywhere is up again this morning. I think uh, I think there's there's an element of uncertainty about what how much this cut will actually feed into real terms cuts. Uh, you know what what amount of it is actually already out of the market. Um, what sort of demand kind of destruction we might be looking at. Um, you know, there's a sense that OPEC's trying to get ahead of the story here, trying to it's making a sort of strategic cut here, looking at 08, looking at, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of instability of oil prices as being a problem, as well as, as well as the absolute level of the oil price. It's actually about making sure that the stability, it doesn't want to see it go from 140 to 35 and back again. It wants it to keep it around 80. So I think, you know, you're not necessarily going to see a massive amount of oil coming off the market and therefore you're not going to see a massive spike in oil prices. Mm. What I thought was interesting overnight was the way the dollar traded, because you normally expect the dollar and the, and the oil price to go in opposite directions, but they actually rose in tandem. Yeah, I think maybe a bit of um, sort of chasing quality, chasing safety with the dollar, catching some bid. It had, it had come off a bit uh, in, in the last couple of weeks. We've seen sterling uh, rise quite, quite well over the last couple of over the last couple of weeks, so I think maybe just a bit of a, uh, a kind of pairing back of those of those moves, um, and also maybe a bit of flight to safety because there's an element that says that if OPEC's doing this, it's, it's starting to panic, it's starting to maybe worry, uh, it's starting to worry about what might happen in a few in a few months' time if there is a 
Um, if this credit tightening that we're seeing from the banks uh, because of the, the problems that they're having actually does lead to, to a credit crunch and what that would mean for the economy. In the meantime, what are you hearing from investors and clients right now about the situation in Ukraine? I mean, it's kind of dropped a bit down the sort of running orders in, in the newsroom somewhat. It has. It has. I think from financial market point of view, we, we've seen it unwind most of the, the sort of the big moves that we saw last year, this time last year, in, in particularly in the commodity spaces, have, have, have to a large extent unwound, and uh, and there's not the same sort of feeling of uh, emer of the, the emergency sort of sense of, if you like, the sort of um, doom doom and gloom. It's, there's a sense that it's rolling on in the background. It's very sad in a way that it's no it's not seen uh, as important. But it's what once it's I, you know all these things are the same. Once they're priced in, if you like, to the market, the market accepts that that's the norm. Um, then, then it's just happening in the background all the time, and that's that's the nature of, of the markets. Yeah, Neil, good to see you this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Still to come here on Ian King Live, as broadband bills rise, I'll be speaking to one company that says it won't be going for mid-contract price hikes. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, the start of this month saw price increases for the millions of households or phone or broadband contracts are linked to the rate of inflation. It's an established practice, but given the current high rate of inflation, has attracted much more attention than usual this year. And it's prompted the industry regulator Ofcom to review whether contracts contain sufficient clarity for customers. Well, joining me now is Richard Tang. He's founder and chief executive of Zen Internet, which does not engage in so-called mid-contract price hikes. Richard, morning to you. Why don't you go in for this? Well, the main reason is for 
to give customer certainty. So if, if, if a customer signs up with a broadband service, you, you contract them for a year or 18 months, then isn't it right that they have certainty during that contract period about what they're going to pay? Certainly in the B2B world, that is the case. But for some reason in the consumer world, it isn't and it hasn't been for a long time. And I mean, you do charge slightly more than some of your competitors to, to balance that, that out. Yes, we do. And again, I think we do that because of certainty. We do that because of the quality of service. I mean, Zen is the UK's only which recommended provider. And, and the, it, we think that that's better than trying to capture lots of market share with a very, very attractive offer, but then almost trick the customer that, well, OK, but partway through your contract, you're going to get a price hike. Maybe at the end of the contract, you're going to get another price hike. And it's that uncertainty, oh. I think, that we, we don't like. Well, BT, which is the market leader, I mean, they're, they're, they do engage in this. Their case for the defence is that they're actually doing what Ofcom has told uh, the industry to do by, uh, you know, it's actually more clear if they know that they're going to raise prices once a year. It's, it's better than some of these unplanned and unannounced price hikes that you used to get in the past. Well, I think the idea that Ofcom has told any of the big players to hike their prices mid-contract is twisting the truth a bit. Um, what Ofcom has said to OpenReach is that OpenReach is allowed to do certain things and, and to raise certain prices. But what the broadband providers do for their consumers is absolutely in their remit. And the fact that Zen doesn't hike prices and the other other of the big players do shows that, you know, this isn't an Ofcom mandate, this is the choice of the supplier um, and it's the choice that we've chosen not to take. I mean, we should point out that not everyone does it. I mean, Virgin Media and Sky, I think, don't uh, put these midterm price hikes into their contracts either, do they? And summer products, it's quite a complex pl playing field, this, isn't it? It is. Some players put it in the small print. They say your price will be hiked on the 1st of April, for example. Some of them don't, but then hike the prices anyway and say, OK, we put your price up. You can leave for free, but if you stay, you've got a, a, a price hike. On the whole, the, biggest, the bigger broadband providers do tend to hike prices mid-contract. Um, at least now they tell customers in the small print what they've done in years gone by is they'll lock customers into a contract and then unilaterally they'll hike prices typically just before Christmas, when people are least likely to switch. And then say, look, you can get out for free, um, but of course you don't want to be switching your broadband before Christmas. And of course they just cash in then on another pound a month or two pounds a month. Yeah. Now, it's very fortuitous that we've got you here in the studio because while we've been on air, Ofcom have actually uh, hit the entire industry with an enforcement uh, ruling. This is over something called one-touch switch broadband. What does that involve for the uninitiated? So Ofcom's intentions are, are, are really good. They want to make it as easy as possible for consumers to switch their broadband supplier, just like with, with electricity or gas. Um, but they put in a, a timeline that the whole industry was telling them it was not achievable. Um, and so the whole industry was lobbying to say, look, we'll do our best. And certainly at Zen, we've got all the software ready. But the software that all us broadband players need to interface to um, was was not coming. So right. it's like, how can we how can we put this new system in place when the system we're interfacing to doesn't even exist yet? And, and so, Ofcom though were very firm. They said, no, we're we're holding to the date. And I think they you know they almost expected that the industry as a whole would. Uh, would fail to meet the day. I think what Zen will do and what other broadband providers will do, you know, we'll work as fast as we can to get everything in place, but we need all the pieces to actually plug into. But essentially when this comes in, it means that if I want to switch my broadband account, uh, I just ring up the new supplier and it's all taken care of from that end. It's, it's much more straightforward. Yeah, and, and already operates like that, um, that it's, it's, it's gaining provider-led switching. Um, but this one-touch switching process makes it even a step easier. It's it, it really as simple as changing your power supplier, for example. You just say, well, I want to switch, bang, that's done. So a good idea, but 
um, a, a, an over-ambitious timescale for Mofcom, in my view. So, given that you've just said that, when would a more realistic timetable be for this to be implemented? Uh, difficult to say. I'd need to speak to our <laughs> software team on that. I'd need to speak to Ofcom on that. Um, at some point later this year, I would, I would yeah. expect. Yeah. And presumably, when it happens, this is going to be pretty good news for your business as a challenger brand. Yeah, definitely. I think anything that makes it easier for customers to switch is good news for Zen. Um, for us, we, we tend not to like to lock con co customers into a contract and think, you know, they're staying because they're locked into a contract. Actually, the majority of our customer base are out of contract, so they stay with us because they like the service. They could go with a month's notice, but they're staying because they like the service. And we, we've done that for 28 years now. And very yeah, good. Okay with that. Well, probably. before I let you go, I mean, the last time we, we spoke, uh, you were talking about a big recruitment drive up in uh, Rochdale, where you're based. How's that been going? Uh, yeah, we're at 560 people now and um, going really well. So we, we're doing well, growing, growing every year. Good to hear. Richard, lovely to see you again. Thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you very much. Still to come here on Ian King Live, the AI-based assistant for online meetings that can take notes, translate and provide analysis all in real time. Don't go away. This is the story of the night. Are you feeling well? There's this illusion of power. They're going to cross to us live. Okay. Thank you so much. Brad Pitt is now a prolific producer behind the scenes. I want to meet that guy. Okay, I'll talk to you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I've had a great time here. I love England and would like to move here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. I'm Greg Milam, and I'm Sky's chief North of England correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Global Insight. Made local. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Reports. Sponsored by Interactive Investor. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Report, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Welcome back. We're going to have a look at this morning's business pages now. We don't have the regular uh, graphic to show you this morning, but I am joined by our sister channel, CNBC, the anchor, Juliana Tattlebaum. Julia, good to see you. This is the front page of the FT. 
No surprises there leading with, with OPEC, I guess. What would you take on this story? Big story over the weekend and big surprise. So no wonder they are leading with the story. Uh, essentially, OPEC Plus came out over the weekend led by Saudi Arabia and announced a production cut. So a cut to oil supplies coming onto the market over the next month, starting next month and running into the end of the year. And this is a big deal because uh, Saudi wants a higher oil price. And this is essentially um, a signal that the U.S. has really lost its influence in the region. This could have a detrimental impact on the U.S. economy via higher energy prices, the impact that could have on inflation, and just more generally what this says about the influence of the Biden administration in that part of the world. In terms of what it means for the price of oil, Goldman Sachs came out today and said we could see the oil price, uh, Brent oil price, rise to $95 a barrel by the end of the year. Uh, I spoke to Andy Critchlow from S&P Global Platts earlier today. Um, he agreed we could see oil prices edge higher. Closer to $100 a barrel is what Saudi and some of the other OPEC nations want. Um, and it really marks a dramatic shift in these geopolitical allegiances. It really does. I mean, you've put your finger on a really crucial point there. I mean, Saudi Arabia has traditionally been a very reliable ally for America in the region. Is that in danger of breaking down permanently, do you think? Well, at the moment, it is very clear that Saudi is getting cozier with Asian nations who've been um, buying cheaper oil over the last several months from Russia and from um, Middle Eastern nations. And uh, again, drawing on what S&P Global Platz has said this morning, you can't really look at this situation in isolation. Um, the, uh, these core oil producers are getting closer to China, they're getting closer to Russia, they want to operate in what S&P calls a multi-polar world. They don't want to be completely reliant on the U.S. So it is really hard to see how the U.S. regains its leverage in the region right now. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, this. Move on, this is the uh, Daily Telegraph uh, front page there. This is the bottom half of it. Uh, 3,000 city jobs in jeopardy as UBS prepares Credit Suisse layoffs. I mean, this is basically implying that jobs are going to go at UBS as well as Credit Suisse. Well, it's super interesting because initially when the UBS Credit Suisse deal was announced, people thought that Credit Suisse jobs were the ones at risk. Now it looks as though um, with Sergio Armati returning to the helm of UBS, and he's known as uh, a powerful and sometimes ruthless leader, uh, we could be looking at jobs at risk across the two entities. So here's what we know. Swiss media reporting that um, we could see the workforce cut by 20 to 30 percent. Not a huge amount of detail into which jobs specifically are at risk, but the report suggests that more than 10,000 jobs are at risk in Switzerland alone. We may see some jobs cut in the U.S. as well, and that's because UBS coming on board, UBS wants to scrap a deal that was in the works to sell Credit Suisse's investment bank to Michael Klein, the Wall Street dealmaker. If that deal goes away, then suddenly you're looking at overlap between the investment banking businesses as well as the other business units. Yeah, horrific. I mean, the, the, the state prosecutor is also looking at this in Switzerland as well, which I just find bizarre given that this was instigated by the Swiss government. It's such a good point. And I mean, even looking at these job cuts, it's so important to bear in mind that this deal didn't come about organically. UBS didn't raise its hand and say, I want to merge, I want to acquire Credit Suisse, depending on which language you want to take. Um, this deal was orchestrated by the Swiss government, the Swiss National Bank, and the market regulator. A lot of open questions still, and we could get a few more answers this week. We've got um, coverage in Zurich uh, and in broader Switzerland this week. We've got Credit Suisse and UBS both looking to give updates to the market. All right. Got to leave it there, Juliana. Great to see you this morning. Thanks for joining me. Now, since the lockdowns, we've all got used to having virtual meetings, some of which can drag on a bit. And one reason they can drag on a bit is it's quite hard to take notes while engaging with participants. Well, it was with that in mind that a group of Polish entrepreneurs sought to develop an AI-based assistant for online meetings that can take notes, translate and provide analysis all in real time. The company's called Smarty Meet and it's just completed pre-seed fundraising with Amazon Web Services Portfolio and the venture capital firm LT Capital participating. Well, joining me now is Lorna Krochak, who's chief executive of Smarty Meet. Uh, Slavonia, welcome to you. You've chosen to launch first of all in the UK. Why is that? Uh, hello, thank you for having me. Why UK? Uh, we are integrated with the HubSpot CRM system, and HubSpot is a well-established player in the sales software market and has a significant presence in UK. There is a steady increase in adoption among small and medium-sized enterprises, which are our ideal customers. 
what's the route this is to the market? Main reason. What's the, and what's the route to market? Are you selling directly to, to customers or do you have third party distribution? Oh, our platform is reserved for B2B, for, for small and uh, medium sized enterprises. And about our product, we are online meeting platform using AI for smooth, enjoyable meetings, boosting productivity and the comfort for sales and IT professionals. What sets Smart Meet apart from the other solutions is the comprehensive support provided by our virtual assistant called Bo, which supports you before, during, and after virtual meetings. Who gives you best AI body uh, on the meeting and he's not going to replace you. Before a meeting takes place, Bo helps you to pick the right agenda for a meeting and prepare you for call by displaying recaps of the past conversation and activities. Bo gives you an information about attendees and the companies they work for, ensuring you are well prepared for the meeting. During meetings, Bo provides real-time transcription and translation, allowing you to focus on discussion. You can track a time on the timeline, mark an important moment, and review them later. If attendees has a tricky technical question, uh, Bo can access the company knowledge base to give you an answer. Finally, after the meeting, our assistant Bo can has you covered with well-organized meeting notes that align with the agenda section. You can easily edit and share those notes with your team via email or transfer them to your own CRM system. Smart Meet streamlines the process to ensure everyone stays in the loop. And we are use the pay-as-you-go business model so you only pay for actual use of Bo Assistant without a monthly subscription. On average, you will pay just one British pound for half an hour meeting. And how big is the addressable market in your opinion? Well, the market is, 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 is very large. We are aiming the companies who are using the CRM system. So this is, this is billions of dollars. Now, you're using uh, open uh, source AI like uh, ChatGPT and Whisper in this service. Why is that? Well, every meeting is different and acquire a various agenda and tools. With the right agenda, you will stay on track and you will not lose your time and be more prepared. We understand that. That's why we offer dozens of predefined agendas and to choose from and you can you own. Agenda is visible, visible all the time on the meeting. After the meeting, our notes are more structured and more precise. Since we understand different meeting types, and we can create a domain-specific recap of each section. And in this case, ChatGPT and Whisper came in handy. Very good. Slavomir, it's very good to speak to you this morning. We've got to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. Have a great day. That's it from me. I'm back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. After this short break, it's Kimberly Leonard. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.